the old ground. I am absolutely thrilled to be here. As you can only imagine, I was excited when uh, Pastor Scott asked me back in March or April, uh, March I think, to come and preach. I think it was going to be in May. I put it on my calendar and I was so excited. And a little something happened that I'll <laughs> expound on in a moment. And I didn't make it in May. And then uh, we talked a couple months ago and, and uh, he said, uh, how about August 27th? Right? Is that right? Yeah, August 27th. And uh, I said, yeah, that'll work. And so I was going to be here last Sunday. And then a little something happened. <laughs> so I'm really glad that we made it, that we're here. It, it worked out. So uh, pray with me quickly. Father, we love you so much. Thank you, God. Thank you for that amazing worship this morning, for your presence here. Lord, for the prayer time and the communion time. Thank you, God, for this church, Lord. Thank you for your presence this morning. Lord, please anoint my lips. Please anoint the ears of the hearers. And Lord, just refresh us today. Let a, let a cool breeze of refreshment from your spirit blow across our hearts today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So when Scott first asked me uh, to come last Sunday and preach, the Lord uh, gave me a sermon and uh, called Eternity. And I was excited about it. I got it all worked out. I got it all done. And I was going to, I was ready. I was all ready. And uh, my, young, my young daughter, Rebecca here, as she often does, said something prophetic in my presence. And I went, and the Lord changed the whole sermon. So, uh, this morning, I'm preaching on the pursuit of happiness, and that was before last weekend, okay, that I was going to preach on the pursuit of happiness, so it's really applicable today. St. Augustine, uh, in 300s, 400s, he had it right. He said, we all want to live happily. The pursuit of happiness is one of the most natural, normal desires of the heart of human people. He said, we all want to live happily. In the whole human race, there is no one who does not assent to this proposition, even before it is fully articulated. And then one of my favorite guys, Blaise Pascal, said, I think in the 1700s, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. The cause of some going to war and of others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attended with different views. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man and woman, even of those who hang themselves. We all, are wired to seek happiness, to seek and pursue happiness. And I'm here to tell you this morning that that's not a bad thing. It's where we seek it that becomes the problem. Seeking happiness, being a pursuer of happiness, is wired into us by our Creator. Another quote from, and, and I'm going to give lots of quotes today because these quotes helped me to get here in my Christian life. And so I want to share them with you. So please bear with me on all of these. Blaise Pascal said again, What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness, of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object. In other words, by God himself. You know, happiness, or as, as we Christians 
mostly talk about joy is the true pursuit of every person. The definition of joy, a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. Happiness, joy, pleasure. Those are the passions. Those are the drives of our heart. That's what we make every decision based on. That's what we do everything based on. And I'm here to tell you today that it's okay and that I'm going to tell you how God has taught me to pursue it and many, many others. Number one, the glorious plan. Where did this come from? The glorious plan. Also, thank you for letting me use my laptop because my printer got wet. <laughs> and, and I'm saving trees by not using paper. Not really. <laughs> but that sounds good at the moment, okay? If you have your Bibles, open to Psalm 1611. The glorious plan of God to fulfill the happiness. And where did this happiness, this drive, this passion for happiness, where did it come from anyway? The first few words of Psalm 1611, which, by the way, the inscription Psalm 1611 is tattooed on my daughter's wrist right there. <laughs> that's, where, that's how I knew. Just kidding. You make known to me the path of life. The path of life is a pursuit of happiness. The pra so the glorious plan. This came to me years ago when I read this quote by Daniel Fuller, one of the founders of Fuller Theological Seminary. God's complete joy in himself as a trinity led him to want to double that joy by extending it beyond himself to the human beings he created. What? That's where creation came from? The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were eternally locked in a love fest, in a joy fest, in a, in a blessed happiness ring and they loved it so much it was so good that they didn't want to keep it to themselves that's what creation was all about that's why God created us he wanted to share his joy and Daniel Fuller said that would double God's joy I can only imagine I can only imagine how he and the angels were looking over the battlements of heaven today as these young people sang beautifully and worshipped God. He's doubling his joy all the time by extending that joy outside of the Trinity. That's what creation was about. St. Augustine said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Blaise Pascal said, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. God wanted to double His joy. He created us to be happy. He created us to be full of joy. The Bible calls Him the blessed God. That word blessed means happy. It's a, it's a synonym for happy. The happy God. God loves being Himself. And he should. He's amazing. He should love being himself. And he loves sharing it with us. That was the plan. And yes, all of us know that in this glorious plan, there was a fall. And there was something dark and corrupt that came in to try and steal all of our happiness. And we have an enemy of our souls that comes to kill, steal, and destroy and take away our happiness. But as Scott said this morning, the cross overcame that. The cross overcame that. The body and blood of Jesus Christ overcame that. And we can still be pursuers of happiness. I love the name of your church, The Haven. Because when my kids were little, 
I came up with an idea to teach them to live in the gifts or the, the fruits of the Spirit. I wanted the Holy Spirit to be a, 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 a vibrant resident in our family and in our home. And so I began to call our house the Haven of Harmony. That was the name of our home, the Haven of Harmony. I said it a million times when my kids were little. The Haven of Harmony, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The Haven of Harmony. And any time somebody would uh, get mad or we'd start fighting with each other, I'd say, wait a minute. This is, this is the haven of harmony. We don't live like this in the haven of harmony. Why? Because I wanted our home to be a little piece of heaven on earth. I wanted it to be a little extension of that trinity, that thermonuclear reactor of joy called the blessed trinity. I wanted it to mimic what's going on in heaven, what we're going to get to live in forever and ever someday. The haven of harmony. And you know what? That imprinted on the Bullen family, thank God. And today, my grown kids, some of whom are in this room, are my best friends in the world. They absolutely are a delight and a joy to be around. And we do ministry all over the world together. And we have more fun than Christians should be allowed to have because we're pursuers of joy. We're pursuers of happiness. That was God's plan. That's the master plan. Number two, the greatest treasure. The glorious plan and the greatest treasure. Psalm 1611, the next phrase says, in your presence there is fullness of joy. The greatest treasure is the presence of God Himself. Oh, You know this. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. I'm preaching to the choir today. You know this. You look around and you see people all over this world stuffing that God-shaped vacuum in their soul with all kinds of terrible things, just trying to find happiness. And they don't know that the greatest treasure is the one for whom the vacuum was created. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, Our good, good Father. That's who the greatest treasure is. In your presence, you make known to me the path of life, pursuing joy. In your presence is where the joy is. George Mueller, that great pastor, great orphanage director, great missionary, said, the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day is to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about is not how much I might serve the Lord, how I might glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state and how my inner man might be nourished. Because true ministry is an overflow of your own joy in the Lord. True ministry is getting so full of God that He's just bubbling out of you and everybody that gets around you gets some splashed on them. That's true ministry. The pursuit of happiness in God. The pursuit of joy. Our first and great and primary business is to be happy in the Lord. Sam Storms pastor in Oklahoma City and great author wrote the single most important principle I ever discovered is this the goal or purpose of the Christian is precisely the pursuit of happiness in God the reason for this is that there is no greater way to glorify God than to find him in him the happiness that my soul so desperately craves. He goes on. You weren't created for boredom or burnout or bondage to lust or greed or ambition, but for the incomparable pleasure and matchless joy that knowing Jesus alone can bring. 
Only then, in Him, will you encounter the life-changing, thirst-quenching, soul-satisfying delight that God, for His glory, created you to experience. That's God's greatest desire for us. Happiness in Him. Joy in Him. In His presence. Jesus said in John 15, 11, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. I've told you these things. What things? Go back two verses. Remain in my love and love each other. That's your church's mission statement. Love God, love others. That will change the world. Because you get so full of him, you start spilling out on other people, and they get so full of him, it starts spilling out on other people, and they get so full of him, it starts spilling out on other people. And God is the greatest treasure. I love how Johnny Erickson Tata, the quadriplegic that has a ministry all over the world, I love how Johnny Erickson Tata says it. She says, God happily shares his gladness. His joy comes flooding over heaven's walls, filling my heart in a waterfall of delight, which then in turn always streams out to others in a flood of encouragement. And then erupts back to God in an ecstatic fountain of praise. I want to know God like this, she says. Shove me under the waterfall of the Trinity's joy, which splash and spills over heaven's walls. If he's always in a good mood, I want to catch it. Man, I can't even tell you how many times in my life I've read that quote. I have it on my phone and I read it often, often, because I want to be under the waterfall of God's joy. When I was a young preacher, 19 years old, I ran across Psalm 63. And I memorized it in the King James. So it goes... O oh God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee, my flesh longeth for Thee, as in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. You know, I bet a week hasn't gone by since I was 19 and I'm 51 that I haven't quoted part of that chapter. O oh God, You are my God. Earnestly I seek You. I'm after Him. I'm after him. I tell him all the time, I'm coming for you. I'm after you. Because I want to be happy. Like every other human being ever born, I want to be happy. I want to be full of joy. I want to be a blessing to be around. That's my ministry to the world. David Wilkerson used to talk about trysting places. Kind of an old English word, but a, tr a trice or a tryst. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Was a, was a little fling between two lovers. And so he, his lover was God, and so he said that he had trysting places where he met with God. And I love that because I remember mine. When I was 16 years old, God radically saved me in the mountains of New Mexico. And there was a mountain behind my house, and I used to go up there with my hatchet and chop down pine boughs and build a little prayer hut. And I would stay up there all night in that little prayer hut, and I would walk up and down that bony rock ridge of that mountain crying out to God I want more of you I want more of you it was a trysting place I went to Bible college in Springfield Missouri and there was a park called Doling Park I would run over there I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning and as I ran by the girls dorm I would see this pretty redhead looking out the window of the dorm window and she would wave to me and I knew she was about to go to her prayer meeting and I was about to go to mine. She's sitting on the front row here today. <laughs> We've been married 32 years this last month. I would run to the park. There was a wood table there. I would kneel down at that table and spend time with God. I want more of you. I need some more. Trysting places. Pursuing happiness. And then I been in parks all over the place, all over Albuquerque, New Mexico, all over the place when we moved here. When we moved here, there was a, a little circle that our house was on, 
came into our neighborhood and then there was a circle that came back. I would walk that circle at night crying out to God. One time we lived in a house where there was a, in New Mexico where there was a big rock, big piece of granite rock sticking up out of the neighborhood. It was just a big old huge rock, three or four stories tall. And it had a little, a little cut in it where you could climb up on it. Oh, many a night I sat up on that rock. There's a little kind of a little pocket in the top of the rock. I'd sit up there, oh, pray. I remember those prayers to this day. I remember the answers to those prayers. Walked around our apartment complex after we lost our house. Another story for another me message. But all my life, the greatest joy of my life, the thing I thank God the most for, is for 35 years in July, this last July, I've been chasing after him. I've been chasing after him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. You only can... If you get a taste of him, you're done for. You're going to spend the rest of your life chasing after some more of that. That's who he is. That's how good he is. Number three, the greatest adventure. The grandest adventure. The glorious plan, the greatest treasure, and the grandest adventure. That is chasing after him. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Walking with Him. Walking with Him. Living with Him. Being on mission with Him. That's the greatest adventure. Chasing Him. And touching many, many lives around the world as you go. C.S. Lewis, who knew this well, and who taught me well, said, if there lurks in most modern minds the notion that to desire our own good and to earnestly hope for the enjoyment, if it lurks in the minds of modern man that this is a bad thing, I submit that this notion has crept in from Immanuel Kant and the Stoics and is no part of the Christian faith. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are too easily pleased. There's such a joy out there for us. There's such a happiness out there for us. Matthew 13, 44, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again and sold everything he owned to get enough money to buy that field. That's what my life looks like. I found a treasure when I was 16 years old. And man, oh man, I've lost everything multiple times trying to get some more of it. Because full joy is in radical following. At his right hand, right there with him, Whatever he's doing in the world, at his right hand is where the pleasures are. I think of it like this. If you're a Watt fan, J.J. Watt, right? I do know him. I just, I mean, I know about him. I just forgot his first two initials for a second. If you're a J.J. Watt fan, if you've got his jersey with his name on the back, if you've got pictures of him on the wall, that's awesome. But can you imagine what it's like to be one of his best friends on the team? To be with him in the locker room? To suit up 
and to go out on the field with him, to line up next to him? Can you imagine what that's like? I don't want to be a Jesus fan. I don't want to just know his word really well. I don't want to just know all the doctrines. I don't want to just know all the religious cliches. I want to be on his team. I want to be in the battlefield with him. I want to suit up in his armor. I want to walk on the earth and the demons tremble and souls are brought up into his presence. I want to be a teammate. Years ago, I was sitting in a faith walking meeting, which I know your pastor loves. The first day of the first meeting I ever went to a lady said something that shocked me but changed my life. She said, we don't go on mission to win the world. And I had spent a lot of time of my life running around the world to win the world. So this made me sit up and take notice. She said, we don't go on mission to win the world because that isn't a big enough vision. I said, what? Winning the world's not a big enough vision? You know, I'm thinking this real fast as she's saying it. And then she said, we go on mission because God is on mission and we want to be with him. I said, ah, she's right. Yeah, I do want to win the world because I want to be right there watching him touch people, watching him change lives. I want to go, I want to take daddy by that right hand that Psalm 1611 talks about. I want to go to work with daddy. I want to sit up on his workbench and he hands me a hammer and a little block of wood and I bang on it and kind of watch him work and I bang on it like I'm really working, like I'm really doing something. <laughs> and then go home and tell my family about what we built together while I banged on a block and he did all the hard work. That's my ministry. That's my real life. I just get to be along. He's doing all the work. I just get to be along. Matthew Barnett, one of my heroes, my daughter worked for him for a year in inner city Los Angeles at the Dream Center. He said, unfortunately, we live in a traumatized world in part because so many people fail to identify and pursue the cause He has given them, even though it would provide the happiness and fulfillment they have been seeking. They have failed to build their lives around that cause. John Walker said, Jesus calls you to a miraculous life one that requires edge-of-your-seat faith to follow him, where you find yourself asking in joy, what's next, Jesus? What are you going to do through me today? You can have that, he says. Jesus is calling you. The pursuit of happiness is our Christian mission. That's our life. That's our, that's our job as Christians. Several years ago, Pastor John Piper said something that changed my life. If there's one statement that ever rocked my world, it's this one. How then do you serve God, he said. I stopped and took notice. I was listening to it on a, on a tape. How then do you serve God? You posture yourself and you maneuver your life and you devote energy and effort and time and creativity to positioning yourself under the waterfall of God's continual blessing. You find out where the waterfall is falling and you get under it. When it moves, you follow it so that you stay wet. And then he chuckled and said, and usually it takes you overseas. I said, what? I'm pastoring a church in Tomball, Texas. I've been pursuing joy for decades it hasn't taken me overseas. What's he talking about? Sorry I asked that question. Not really sorry. <laughs> because about a year after that, God dropped a little Liberian orphan girl from Liberia, Africa on my doorstep. 
She was 13 years old and weighed 48 pounds, was almost dead. <laughs> and God brought the nations to me to get a hold of my heart. Because he said, you've been begging me. You've been begging me to let you come with me. Let you be my teammate. Well, I'm doing some things in Africa. So I'm going to train you by sending you an African and get you ready for my mission. Today, she's a beautiful 23-year-old daughter who tells me all the time, I love you, Daddy. And I just look up. I'm like, yep, that's the waterfall. Yep, I'm, I'm in the right place. Yeah, yeah, that's joy. Yeah, that's happiness. Yeah, oh, you're, you're all that you said in Psalm 1611. You follow it overseas. I've been chasing that waterfall. This is the tagline for our ministry. Passionately pursuing Jesus on his mission among the nations and mobilizing others to join us in this thrilling adventure. Whoo! That's my life. That's what I do. That's what you guys do too. We have a missional marriage. I was running hard for Jesus. I looked over and I saw this pretty redhead running hard for Jesus. And one day I said, hey. We've been running hard for Jesus together for 32 years on a mission. On a mission. And oh, it's happy. It's joyous. The first year we had a baby. The second year we, had, we got married. First year we had a baby. Second year we had a baby. Third year we had a baby. Fifth year we had a baby. Seventh year we had a baby. And then we adopted four more after that. They're all grown today. They all work with me around the world in ministry, work with us. Our daughter Rebecca spearheaded our ministry in Africa, went and lived in the bush in Zambia for two years. No running water, no electricity. Why? Why would a 24-year-old at the time girl do such a thing? Oh, she would love to have a couple of days of your life to tell you about the joy, about the happiness. My daughter Beverly in the back there and I went on a mission trip to Columbia years ago. Fell in love with a bunch of orphans, three of whom are our children today. I remember when we got on the plane to come back, she reached over and gripped my hand so tight it hurt. I looked over and she was crying. I was already crying. She said, Daddy, please promise me we won't forget what we saw. We won't forget what we felt. We'll go home and do something about this. And we have been. We've, we've been walking with Daddy holding his right hand where the pleasures are forevermore. And we've seen hundreds of Colombian orphans get help. 35 of them got adopted into Christian families in Houston. And I get to see them all the time now as grown, married, with their own children, people. Can you imagine the joy? I'm like, oh, give me some more of that. <laughs> give me some more of that. Call this ministry my holy addiction, because it is. We have a missional family, because we want to be teammates. I'm not, I don't criticize or judge anybody that's a fan of Jesus, because I know him. He'll eventually work them into being teammates, <laughs> even if they're not there yet. But I want to be a teammate, not just a fan. My daughter Beverly wrote me, a few years ago, something that made me realize that I was so full I was splashing onto other people. She said, Dad, watching you is a great encouragement to me. The way you are so sensitive to God's Spirit drawing you, the way you love people and encourage them in Christ, you make following Christ attractive to me. I can see the great fulfilling joy it brings you. I can see the life it brings, and I want it. That's what I want my kids to see. 
I want them to be attracted by a dad who's on a pursuit of happiness. We've been doing ministry in South America, all over Africa, and I'll finish with this. February, I went to Colombia. I got to stand in the jungle in the poorest part of Colombia and train pastors for three days, whole room full of pastors. I got to see them weep as I told them about this because they wanted some more. Got on a little plane, flew to another city. The pastor said, we're going to have you train pastors, but we're also going to have you do a crusade. I said, great, because I was a teenage evangelist. That's how I started my ministry. For 10 years, I was an evangelist. I'd love to do a crusade. Took me over, and there was this two main streets in this town. They set up a stage in the intersection of these two streets, and everybody brought their chairs. Showed up the first night. There was 1,000 people sitting in the street on chairs. Preached. Many of them came and got saved. Next night, showed up. There were 1,500 people sitting in the street in chairs. Showed up the next night, there were 2,500 people sitting in the street in chairs. Gave the invitation that night and hundreds came. Oh, the joy I was feeling. Oh, the rush. There's no high like the most high. Oh, the joy I was feeling. I turned to my daughter, Brooke, who's a full-time missionary in Columbia. I turned to her after this, after the meeting. And I said, I can go to heaven now. She said, don't say that, Daddy. We still need you. I said, I know. I'm not saying I want to die. I'm saying I'm good. I can go to heaven right now. I'm good. It don't have to get any better than this. I'm full. She said, please don't say that. We still need you around. I came home, started preparing. I was going to go to... Pakistan and preached to 10,000 people in an open field. I was going to go to Nepal. I was going to go back and preach all over Central Africa in July. Hold great crusades. I needed a little more income to buy some plane tickets. So I took a job inspecting a building in the woodlands. Went to the job, put my 16-foot ladder up on the building, Remembered to do something real quick, pulled out my phone, opened my wire, wiring app, wired the last of the money to the guys in Liberia who are building a school for us in the hometown of my daughter, Mercy, my African daughter, called Mercy's House. It's going to be a school. I sent the last of the money. I said, yes, God. They're putting the roof on our school right now. Closed my, closed my phone, put it in my pocket, climbed up to the top of that ladder, 16 feet up. I don't remember anything after that. Somehow, I don't even know how, I fell. Fell 16 feet, landed on concrete. Shattered my face, broke three vertebrae, broke eight ribs, broke my sternum, both collarbones, crushed my spleen, part of a kidney, Brain started bleeding in three different places. A young lady that wasn't even supposed to be there came walking by and saw me, called 911. Saw my phone lying on the ground, picked it up and said, call my wife. And it dialed my wife. She said, your husband's here. This is the hospital they're taking him to. I'd have died right there on that sidewalk if she hadn't happened to be walking by. She's never there. God placed her there. They got me to the hospital in 11 minutes. Trauma surgeon, Timothy Hodges, worked on me for eight hours. Came out after eight hours and told my wife and my children, he's not going to make it. Prepare yourselves. I worked on him for eight hours, putting fires out in his body, but there's nothing else I can do. All my Christian family flooded the hospital. Pastor Scott would beat my wife there in the morning. 
I don't know if they gave him any trouble trying to come in, but he would say, I'm his best friend. They'd say, okay, come on in. Thank you, brother. You are. 25 days I lay unconscious in the ICU. Four infections hooked up to every machine. Every day they came up with a new reason why I wasn't going to make it. And they were doing their job really, really well. I loved them all. They were just trying to be honest. There was no way I should have survived. This was four months ago. April the 11th is when I fell. Five months ago now. The morning of May 4th, my wife was in her prayer closet, getting ready to go to the hospital, praying, begging God to wake me up. The day before, they told her, please go ahead and put him in hospice. He's not, he's not going to make it. My pastor called her. She saw it was him and answered the phone. They prayed together over the phone. That God would wake me up. She got dressed, got in the car, came to the hospital, walked in my room, walked up to my bed, and I opened my eyes and said, good morning, beautiful. She said, it's you. It's really you. I said, yeah. Why am I tied down to this bed, and where am I? I've been healing. I'm legally blind. Some of the bleeding in my brain my right eye is completely blind. My left is foggy. But I can walk. I can see good enough to read big font on this computer screen. <laughs> I got my voice back. I can pursue happiness. First thing I told the Lord when I woke up in the ICU was, it's okay, Lord. If I'm just going to be a prayer warrior now, I can still do that. Yeah. Happiness. I was so excited I could preach again and I was going to come here last Sunday and preach <laughs> and my kids had to come and rescue my wife and I, take us through the deep water. The next day, our, last Monday, our house had five feet of water in it. Everything's gone. And all my friends, like all good friends do, wrote me and they said, don't be discouraged. Don't get discouraged. And I, I wrote them all back and I said, honestly, I, I'm trying to be real honest right now. If losing my vision and being in horrific pain the last five months couldn't steal my joy, losing some stuff in my house sure ain't going to steal my joy. Don't worry. Because I'm on a pursuit. I'm on a pursuit of happiness. My last quote. I don't know what the next 25 years are going to look like, but I know this. I'm coming after him. I'm coming after you. I want some more. J. Campbell White said, most people are not satisfied with the permanent output of their lives. <laughs> Nothing can wholly satisfy the life of Christ within His followers except the adoption of Christ's purpose toward the world He came to redeem. Fame, pleasure, and riches are but husks and ashes in contrast with the boundless and abiding joy of working with God for the fulfillment of His eternal plans. The men and women who are putting everything into Christ's undertaking are getting out of life its sweetest and most priceless rewards. Will you join the adventure? It's worth it. He's worth it. He's worth it. I know all of you are on the adventure. And the reason I came today was to encourage you to take it up a notch, to get yourself some more. It's okay to be happy. It's okay to be passionate to be happy. It's okay to pursue happiness. Just get it where it really exists and not where 
the enemy lies in your ear and tells you it exists. It's out there. It's out there. I don't know what God's waterfall of joy looks like for you. But I came to encourage you to find it, get under it, and live there for the rest of your life. Amen.